Hey, this is Jussi, I run a small investment firm that specializes in REIT investing. And recently I went on the Bigger Pockets podcast to have a debate about REITs versus rental properties. This was my first podcast ever and I would strongly recommend that you watch it entirely. I'll put a link to it somewhere in the description of this video. But today I want to bring your attention to a specific segment of the podcast in which I explain why REITs are more rewarding than rental properties. It's very comprehensive, but it's important that you stick till the very end to really fully understand why REITs are so rewarding. Let me know what you think in the comment section of the video and now enjoy. So why REITs are more rewarding than rental properties in most cases? Um, before I dive into this, I think it's very important to correct some misconceptions that are very common on this topic. The first misconception that I see all the time is investors will assume that REITs are less rewarding because you not, cannot buy REITs with a mortgage. But this reasoning is wrong because REITs are already leveraged investments. When you're buying shares of a REIT, you're buying the equity. And so it's the equivalent of your down payment. REITs will then add leverage on top of it in the form of a mortgage, or it can also be in the form of bonds, uh, convertibles, preferred equity, lots of different uh, forms of capital to leverage your, your equity. And so you enjoy the same benefit as if you were buying a rental property, I would argue that you enjoy even better benefits of leverage because REITs in most cases might get better terms than you could because these are large, diversified, publicly listed companies. Uh, banks are, will be much happier to work with those than with a small rental property investor, which is typically a riskier profile. So that's the first misconception to get out of the way. Then the second one that I see often is that people assume that REITs are less rewarding because they must pay their managers uh, large salaries. And so investors will assume that they, they can save those expenses by taking care of their properties themselves. But, but you know, and it's, it's true that REITs are paying millions to their top executives, but because they enjoy such a large scale, uh, the management cost as a percentage of the total assets is actually going to be very small and much smaller than that of private properties in most cases. Um, here we can take the example of realty income, which is one of the most popular REITs in the world, maybe the most popular its management cost as a percentage of its total assets is just 30 basis points every year. Um, if you own a rental property and you outsource the management to a property manager, it's going to be a lot more expensive than this. If you do it yourself and you actually count how many hours you spend on it, give some dollar amount to this uh, to, to account for the value of your labor, it's also going to be more expensive in most cases. Then the third misconception is on taxes. Rental property investors think that they enjoy the best tax benefits, that REITs are not even comparable. But once more, this is not really the case in my opinion. I actually pay le less taxes investing in REITs than in rental properties. And so rental properties are very tax efficient. I agree with this. Uh, they, a big part of this is the non-cash depreciation, which allows you to defer a lot of the taxes far into the future. But REITs enjoy very similar benefits. Uh, for one, REITs in most cases will retain about 30 to 40% of their cash flow in the four, within the company. Uh, remember that the rule of 90% applies to taxable income, which is much lower than cash flow because of non-cash depreciation. And so whatever the REIT is going to retain in most cases, 30 to 40% is not taxed because REITs don't pay corporate income tax. It's fully tax deferred. Then secondly, a portion of the dividend income is typically going to be classified as return of capital. This is also fully tax deferred. Then third thing to consider is that the, the portion of the dividend income that's actually taxed is going to enjoy a 20% deductible. Uh, so that reduces your taxes even further. And then fourth and final here, um, REITs will typically invest in lower yielding, faster growing properties like um, e-commerce warehouses, data centers, cell towers, and so on. And so a larger portion of the returns is going to come from long-term growth and appreciation, which once more is fully tax deferred. Uh, and if all of that is not enough, you could just put your rates in a, in a tax deferred account and defer the rest of it. So there's not a significant advantage here for rentals, despite seeing that all the time in various comment sections debating this topic. And then the final misconception is I see all the time rental property investors claim that uh, they are earning 20, 25, 30% uh, annual total returns. Um, in some rare cases, this may be the case, but in most cases, I think that they are simply miscalculating their returns. Uh, Warren Buffett became the richest investor on earth by compounding at 20% per year. So 
I just don't buy into it that your average rental property investor is doing better than that by doing it as a side gig. I think what's happening here is that they're miscalculating their returns in two ways. Uh, the first and most important is that they're not accounting for the value of their own labor. They will, uh, you know, spend countless hours finding the right deal, um, negotiating it, financing it, then uh, finding the renovating it, finding the tenant, managing the property, and so on. And <laughs> really, it's countless hours that goes into it. If you now decided that each hour is worth thirty dollars, and you deducted this amount from your returns, you would see that. A very big portion of your return is actually just your labor. It's not the return on your invested capital. Um, and I think you really should deduct this because you could use all this productive time to work extra hours at your main job or a, a side hustle or anything else. So, so if you want to really see the real return on your invested capital, you need to deduct this. And then secondly, I think that investors will also commonly make the mistake of looking at their typical year, the typical good year. Uh, they will, let's say it's 15%, 20% the return on, on the, your typical year. But in real estate, you, you have good years. Let's say you have five good years. And then on year six, you have some major expenses because you need to reinvest in your property. This may cost you one or even two years of rental income. If you now calculate the average return over these six years, your, your return is going to come down quite a bit. So, so now with these misconceptions out of the way, uh, we can, uh, discuss a few research studies that have been made on this topic, comparing the returns of REITs versus those of private real estate, as well as private equity real estate fund. You want to say something, Scott? I, I just, you know, because I, I, we, we have a lot of real estate investors who are probably like, he's kind of right on a couple of those points. I want to agree with you and then provide a couple of other things for your reaction here for a second. So first, I want to see your $30 an hour of finding a good deal and raise you. I think that in order to buy a rental property responsibly, you need to put in, and, and you'll find many of our investors do, hundreds of hours of self-education, like, like the one that perhaps folks are consuming right now, listening to this podcast, right? Which is valuable time. Maybe you're doing something else or driving or at the gym or whatever while you're listening to this, but that is uh, uh, on top of the time that you've just described there. Um, about the dollar per hour value of that time, I often have thought that real estate's a really valuable activity for someone to get into when they're perhaps a lower or middle or maybe even lower upper middle class, if that makes any sense, like right in those ranges. Because, you know, if you're a doctor or a lawyer, you're probably not going to want to put in all those hours at 30, 40, $50 an hour, um, depending on what you, how you value that time at, at that point in time. But it can be rewarding, um, at more rewarding than many side hustles that are available to you, uh, if your dollar per hour time is less than that, for example. So I think you see a lot of folks. And once you pay that price to get into it for the first five years and know how to do all this, you can then reap the benefits for the rest of your career. So that's one uh, nuance, I think, to your argument that I largely agree with, uh, you see, on um, around uh, straight rental property investing. And then I want to give you one challenge and see how you react to it um, on this. One of the things that I enjoy, I think, is an advantage as a real estate investor with a portfolio here in Denver over my competition in the, or my alternative choice in investing in REITs is the ability to have used and to continue to use fixed 30 year low interest rate, uh, debt that reduces my risk and maybe amplifies my returns in a way that, uh, REITs are typically not able to access with the same, um, the same low risk and low rates. Would you agree with that as a, as a potential advantage for the, the little guy here? Sorry to interrupt you here for a second, but could you please do me a huge favor and like the video? It really helped me a lot to grow this channel and also make sure to subscribe to not miss any of our future investment opportunities. Definitely. Those are two good counterpoints and I agree with you here. And I also, I, I don't want to sound here as if I'm just bashing on private real estate. Uh, I think private real estate is a great investment. I'm just making the argument that I think that REITs are slightly better in most cases for most people. This is awesome. We want we want the listeners to get a challenge and to think outside of the box. And you know, you're both kind of touching on something here that everyone needs to realize what kind of investor they are. Um, what's your hourly wage normally? What what do you desire to do with your time? If you're a professional, and you know, like the the pa it, publicly traded REITs are by magnitude more passive than anything you can do on your own in real estate. I mean, that that in itself, if and we'll get into these research studies you were referencing, I, I would love to hear about this next. Um, but that in itself, even if someone were to 
to prove, you know, I can do a lot better if I do it on my own in real estate, even with my hourly wage, even if they can kind of make that case. You, in my opinion, you actually, you need to do quite a bit better because if, <laughs> if you're putting that much time and your resources into it and it's only a little bit better, well, man, I, that, that's not worth it if you can be fairly passive with these publicly traded REITs. And to, to reinforce UC, uh, UC's point here, you know, in the, those, those high returns, 20, 15, 20, 25%, maybe they are being achieved by some real estate investors. But if so, it's typically going to be in the first few years of the hold. And it only can be sustained if you're consistently applying very high leverage, um, to those deals. And that maybe is another exa- advantage that the, uh, the little guy enjoys. Um, over REITs where they can actually leverage much higher, up to 75% LTV with this kind of fixed rate debt. Uh, and in, in the acquisition, 85 or even 95 to 100, you know, 100% if you're an owner occupant in those first deals. Um, so maybe that's a, a, a part of that as well. And then one last thing I'll, I'll also throw in there uh, before we, we let you resume your wonderful thoughts here, you see, is, is the uh, efficient efficiency of the market, right? Uh, a, a listener might argue uh, with you and say, well, REITs are already priced appropriately because smart guys like UC are constantly debating the actual the, the value of those things. But there's a lot of good deals to be found in my local neighborhood because I know how to add a bedroom or do the do the work there to to create some value on the on the upswing. So, so those are those are three very good counterpoints. I want to quickly address all three of them. The first one was on the hourly hourly wage, and I, I completely agree with you that. The more you value your time, uh, the less sense it's going to make to invest in rental properties. If you're a doctor, you're a lawyer, or you're, you're a busy entrepreneur that's earning a good amount of profit through his own business, then probably buying rental properties makes less sense. But then, yeah, if you're, your hourly wage is relatively low, it makes more sense. But even then, you know, if you count to really calculate it, all the amount of time you're spending educating yourself and then finding the deals, doing all the work, even if you valued your time, let's say $15 per hour, I would argue that the returns would change very drastically in most cases, and it becomes quite a bit less rewarding. But here you could also make the argument that if it's work you enjoy, then it makes sense. And a lot of people enjoy this type of work. Uh, but then to your second point, and this is probably, the, I think, the strongest argument in favor of investing in private real estate. And I myself own some private real estate. This is one of the reasons why uh, you, you can really lever- use even more leverage. And in some specific cases, I think it makes sense uh, with some limits, though. There are some limitations to it. Uh, but, but, you know, REITs, they, they typically don't use quite as much leverage but on the flip side, they're going to be having, they're going to have access to a much larger variety of capital, as I mentioned earlier. So they can use mortgages, they can use bonds, convertibles, preferred equity. Typically, REITs will have a bunch of debt. Let's say they will have a 40 or 50% LTV, and then they'll add still a bit of preferred equity to leverage your common equity even more. Uh, so, so you're still getting a very good, uh, you know, bump from all of that leverage as a common shareholder of a, of a REIT, even if it's, not quite as much of that in the case of a private rental property, perhaps. And then your third counterpoint, that was, um, what was it again? Can, can you remind me quickly? I, I wasn't counting all my counterpoints. Uh, yeah, I wish I could remember <laughs> okay. too. Okay. <laughs> I think I think it was the uh, the hourly rate of time can be worth it. The uh, uh, the the and then the leverage. The local neighborhood. The local neighborhood. Yes. The yeah, efficient market. Right. The efficiencies of the market. So so I agree that there are inefficiencies in the private market. Then, but I would argue that this applies very much also to the public REIT market because when you think of REITs, they're a bit of an odd category because. You know, they are right in between real estate and stocks. And real estate investors typically don't trust the stock market. And then stock market investors typically don't understand real estate. And as a result, you have quite frequent mispricings happening in the REIT sector. Um, I'm, I'm a dedicated REIT analyst and I specialize in this sector, but there aren't actually that many people doing what I'm doing. Uh, and this is part of the reason why I have this platform today at such a young age, because there are just not many people doing this. Um, most investors in the REIT segment, they are generalist uh, investment firms, you know, generalist analysts looking at them with relatively little understanding about real estate. And so not surprisingly, you have mispricing Zucker. Uh, I could point you to several examples of REITs, and we can discuss this later, that are today priced at very large discounts to the value of their properties. Um, but so these are my three quick counter- counterpoints uh, to your counterpoints, which I think are, are valid and very good. Uh, but so there, there are a few research studies that have been made on this topic comparing the returns of both. 
And the, the, the main conclusion here is that real est- REITs typically outperform private real estate by about 2 to 4% per year on average. And this may sound surprising to some of you, but I think it's a result that's very much expected because REITs enjoy significant economies of scale in their management, which we discussed earlier. They also enjoy significant economies of scale in all their other costs. Uh, let's take the example of an apartment REIT here that does a deal with a contractor in a specific city to change 100 carpets each year. Uh, Naturally, it's going to get a much better rate with this contractor than you could as a private rental investor changing one carpet every year. Um, But this applies to really every cost. Uh, They're going to pay less brokerage fees. They're going to, even their property taxes, REITs are going to have legal team uh, working for them full time. They're going to be able to fight the property tax hikes and and so on. So so they're able to be much more cost efficient on every level. Then REITs will typically also develop their own properties to earn higher returns and create value for shareholders. This requires a lot of skill and resources. Most private investors are not able to do that themselves. Um, REITs have better access to a wide variety of capital, which allows them to really take advantage of some, uh, you know, uh, distortion in the market. Sometimes they're priced at a discount to the NAV. They can buy back shares, creating value for shareholders. Sometimes they're priced at a premium to NAV. They can issue equity in the public market, raise it, buy more properties at a positive spread, which then results in cash on, in growth on a cash flow per share basis. Um, what else? REITs have the best talent working for them. That obviously helps. They are able to pay them very generously because of their large scale and it's still very much cost efficient. Um, REITs can also enter other real estate related businesses to earn additional profits thanks to their platform. To give you an example here, Farmland Partners, which is one of the biggest farmland REITs, it has also a brokerage business. So it's going to help some third parties sell their farmland and earn fees. You as a shareholder, you participate in in these profits as well. So I think these are the main reasons why REITs have been able to be, have been more rewarding in the past uh, in, in according to those studies. And in my opinion, it makes sense. So these are all the reasons why I eventually decided to quit my career in private equity real estate and decided to become a professional REIT investor. I think that in most cases, REITs are more rewarding and that's despite being safer and a lot more passive. Now, if you want to access my entire REIT portfolio, feel free to join High Yield Landlord, my REIT newsletter for a two week free trial. I'll put a link to it somewhere in the description of this video. And otherwise, if you could still please like this video, that would really help me a lot to grow this channel. Thank you so much for your support and see you at my next one. Bye bye.